First time I am talking after more than two and a half years in person. Okay. I have given many talks uh, online, but uh, never, I mean, it has been more than two and a half years. The last talk I gave was in Ferguson College in February 2020, and then the pandemic started and it was a disaster. And uh, so, this is one thing which I wanted to say, and I have been to this, uh, been to SP College had given a set of lectures in 2005 on uh, relativity and uh, special relativity, general relativity, so on. And uh, I was invited by Professor Bengare to uh, actually give this set of talks. And the occasion was actually Einstein centenary for his 100 years after special relativity. I mean, not just special relativity. In 1905, he wrote uh, four or five papers, I think, which were excellent papers. One of them was relativity, uh, special relativity, and the other was uh, Brownian motion, photoelectric effect, and for that he got the Nobel Prize. Okay, so that was uh, the 1905 uh, thing, and there was a conference arranged that time, and that is the time I gave uh, at least five six lectures on special and general relativity, and uh, so that was one. Another uh, uh, connection also I have with SP College is uh, you have an excellent library. So I have used your library when I was uh, doing my MSc in 1974. I have come here to the library. So that's uh, almost 50 years back. Okay. And uh, I have used the library because uh, we had this course on hydrodynamics. Okay. And uh, the problems were quite, uh, they were tripos problems actually, what was called the Cambridge. There used to be a tripos exam. And uh, so, those problems were actually like that. And Ragnar Kerkar, I think, who is from here, from SP College, he has a set of books which are there in the, uh, in the library. And I refer to those notes to look at the solutions to those uh, quite uh, tricky problems which were there in hydrodynamics. So, uh, so I have some connection with SP College. I just wanted to bring it out. Okay, so now on to my talk. So, this is the observing the universe uh, through ripples in space-time. Now, what does the Lord mean by ripples in space-time, which is, uh, which may be of uh, not so easy to see. Ripples in space-time is actually ripples in the curvature of space-time. It's the ripples in gravity waves. In the gravitational waves are uh, in the Einstein's theory. In fact, uh, gravitation is in fact manifestation of the curvature, as I will come to and describe. So this ripples in space-time means just gravitational waves. Okay. So a century-long wave. So 1916, 1915, Einstein gave his theory of gravitation, or which is the general theory of relativity. In fact, this is actually a theory of gravitation. I said the general theory of relativity, and probably this the names of the theories are the worst names. I mean, they have not been given. <laughs> it's, it's not have been called relativity, actually, it should have been called theory of gravitation. Okay. It was an improvement on Newton's theory. And uh, so, this I'll tell you in which way uh, as I go along. In 1915, this was the eyesight theory of relativity was given. So, he gave it what are called the field equations. And he worked on it from 1905 when he was special relativity. Only for 10 years he required to actually build this theory because it required a different kind of mathematics. It required Riemannian geometry as the base. The space-time is a Riemannian manifold. Okay. Okay. By the way, I am actually I did my applied. I mean, my MSc degree is in mathematics. So I will. But I did PhD in physics. So I had to orient myself to how physics think. And it took me a year or two. It was really hard for me to change from the way mathematicians think and the way physicists think. <laughs> but anyway, I have seen both sides of the world. So, in 1916, one year later, I said predicted 
the existence of gravitational wave. So you can show that in the equation. Okay. You predict that gravitational waves. Oh. No, that is not good. Is there a point? 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 Is there a and you can see, I don't know, you can, or you can partially see the two detectors in the US, which are called the LIGO detectors, the big interferometric detectors which are described. They detected two identical waveforms. So these detectors are placed 3,000 kilometers apart. Okay? But they saw these identical waveforms in the two detectors and 7 milliseconds apart. And that the reason is because the source was not exactly uh, orthogonal in the direction which is uh, the line drawing the detector, but at some angle, it came from the southern hemisphere. Okay, so that's why there was a difference of seven milliseconds. But if you change, if you put the waveform over each other, they exactly match. Okay, the thing. And this was a direct detection of gravitational waves. And at that time, this was September 14th, uh, 2015. And at that time, I was in the US, okay, and. Uh, uh, next day there was a mail, uh, okay, on the screen. I could see that there was this detection. And uh, at that time, I didn't think it was a detection. I mean, I thought if somebody is taking the food, that <laughs> there are these people, okay, there are some inter inner group of the LIGO. They sometimes put in waveforms, okay, in the thing, to keep the people who are data, doing data analysis alert, so that, to check that they are really alert and see the waveforms, okay. So, I thought, I thought that it was probably that, okay, and uh, it was not clear until it was something like two months later. I thought that around November, I thought it was really a signal. Okay. So, this was the So, this is actually a tale of two Nobel Prizes. The first of the Nobel Prize was in 1993, given to these two radio astronomers. They observed the decay in the orbit of the uh, to a uh, binary pulsar, it is called, okay? 1913 to 16. Pulsars are what? They are rotating neutron stars. So the neutron star is the object, you know, neutron, which is inside the nucleus. Okay? They are neutrons, protons, and so on. They make up the nucleus. Okay? Now, this is a neutron star. Okay? So the all the neutrons are brought together and they form the star. And it's not a black hole. It is not as much dense as a black hole, but it's very pretty dense. I think one centimeter or one cc of it will be like 10 to the 14 grams or 10 to the 15 grams. That is so heavy. Okay, so it's just basically nucleus. Okay, so this is a neutron star, but there is a lot of electromagnetic fields around that, and these electromagnetic fields produce rays or uh, electromagnetic waves, radio waves, which are observed in this thing. And what they saw from this pulsar, so you can actually basically see the pulsar and through radio of course and what they saw was that the orbit was shrinking the orbit was shrinking at the rate of some 70 microseconds per year okay so that was the sort of rate and that rate is exactly predicted by the general theory of relativity and here is a plot which shows that so this uh, this is the curve which is a theoretical curve using general relativity so the smooth curve and the points which you see on this are the observations made by them okay and for 30 years they were observing from 1975 and onwards going on to 2005 and you can see how well the dots are falling onto this. So this was in fact uh, another feather in Einstein's cap okay, after 100 or uh, so many years okay, when uh, we showed that general relativity in fact is consistent or is like theory of gravity. Okay. So and also it showed that gravitational wave exists because the uh, pulsars were sort of uh, whole thing was losing energy and they were coming closer together. Like that, there was a direct detection of gravitational waves. I think this field, faces are cut, but there are three people there. Uh, Kip Thorne and uh, Barry Barish and Ray Weiss, okay, who, uh, who were given the Nobel Prize. And there was a big team actually with this. The team which is the LIGO, LIGO Science Collaboration team. 
and we were part of the team. And now you talk and India and so on. We were part of this team, which actually were, uh, I mean, we made significant contribution towards the detection of gravitational waves. And 2017 was the Nobel Prize, which was given to uh, these three people. But actually, actually, it was the work of the whole team, okay, which uh, really produced the effort. Here is a sort of a picture which tells you the discoveries were binary black holes and neutron stars. And there are two black holes merging. So they look something like this, two black holes going together. They emit waves, okay, as they go around in uh, the general theory of relativity. And they form a single big black hole. Okay. And Tim Thorne actually was one of the Roman laureates there. He had actually, he had said that these were the best kind of photos, right? and it has turned out to be true. These are the only sources we have detected up to now in the last 5-6 years. Binary black holes or neutron stars. So in 300 years of gravitation, which was edited by Hawking and Israel, okay, so uh, if you read his article, he talks about these things in 86, and it is now, I don't know, 2016, maybe 30-40 years later, that uh, these things have been detected. The even at that time. So there are so many detections. So far, there have been three runs by these detectors. You can call the LIGO detectors, LIGO and VIRGO. I will show you those things. LIGO detectors are two of them in the US, and VIRGO is another detector in the Europe, in Italy, in Pisa, okay, where Galileo did his experiments. You know, when he dropped uh, objects from the Tower of Pisa, where things fell down and said that in fact, that everything falls is the same. It was an insight, it's not an experiment. It was an insight that all bodies fall with the same actually. Of course, if you take a rock and a feather, the feather will not fall with that the same way because of air as well. But he had the insight to see that suppose there was no air, both would fall simultaneously. So that was his insight. And uh, that's what is in fact, uh, behind Einstein's theory of general relativity. In fact, the whole theory rests on that, general theory of relativity. It's not the equivalence principle. But anyway, coming back to this, there were runs of this, they are called 3 runs, so over 0, 2, 8, 0, 3. The first run was 4, 5 months, the second run was 8, 9 months or something, and 0, 3 was about one year, little less than a year, because the COVID cut it short. So, about 3 weeks of the run was cut out in March. And there were 90 events detected. So 90 black holes, black binaries, two, or two black hole neutron star binaries, and one neutron star neutron star binary. So all these events were detected. So what did we see with this? So these are all shown here. These are detection, which I call a three-in-one detection. Not only gravitational waves are detected, but also it's a direct detection of black holes. So this is the first direct detection. We saw the waves coming from the black holes. So it is a direct detection of black holes. Up to now there had been no direct detection. Okay? All the things which were said were indirect that there is a black hole. Like for example, one says that there is a black hole at the center of the galaxy. In fact, the 220 Nobel Prize was given to Genzel and Gels, I think, for uh, saying that there is a black hole at the center of the galaxy. This is 4 billion solar mass, 4 billion times the mass of the sun. This is the black hole. But how do you know it's a black hole? You go and see how compact the object is. You look at the orbits of the stars around it. And they found that the orbits of the star are getting down to something like 10 micro arc seconds. Okay? Which is almost the event horizon of the black hole. Okay? Which is something like a million or 10 million kilometers in size. So, Along with Penrose, I think they got the Nobel Prize. Penrose got it for singularity, showing that general relativity, there must be singularity in the theory of general relativity. And also, these people got for this. But that's an indirect detection. You don't actually get anything from the black hole. But here the waves are coming from the black holes. And these are binary black holes. The first time one has seen so many binary stars, and first time we saw binary black holes. We have seen binary uh, stars, we have seen X-ray binaries, we have seen 
radio binary is a pulsar binary pulsar but the first time there is a we have the binary black hole so it is a 3 1 So let me start, okay, so this is sort of pedagogical students and so on. I want to bring you to general relativity. What is general relativity and so on? So we start with Newton's gravity. You start learning from Newton's gravity. There is the inverse square law. F equal to minus g m1 m2 or r square, r cap. Okay? There are two masses, m1 and m2, the distance is r between them. And you get the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance and proportional to the product of the masses. And it is directed along the line joining the masses. And that's Newton there and legendary apple fell on his head. Okay, and then he knew that he was there. So, Newton's gravity. And so many things is explained. So it was a resounding success because planetary orbits were explained. Kepler's law, Kepler was much before Newton, probably 100 years ahead or what, something like that. He had already given the laws for the planets, okay? That the planets go in ellipses, they have planar orbits, then uh, a cube omega square is gm. So that is the cube of the sine of the orbit times the square of the circular frequency is g times the mass, the total mass of the object. So these were the Kepler's laws. And these laws, three laws or four laws could be explained by Newton's inverse square law. Okay. So inverse square law is here and you have to use this, solve this differential equation. d2 r by dt square, this is the acceleration. You have to use Newton's second law. Mass times acceleration is equal to the force. And cancel the mass on both sides. Okay. So you get acceleration d2 r by dt2 equal to this. Now you integrate this equation and what you get is a ellipse. Okay. And exactly this explained the Kepler's laws. So this is in fact, uh, this is how Newton science progresses. This is what I would like to also make a point. There were three Kepler's laws, but just two laws of Newton explained these three laws. And many more things. It was not only planetary orbit. Explained also terrestrial gravity. Okay. Terrestrial gravitation. A stone falls on to the earth. Okay. That is also explained by Newtonian gravity. The same law. F equal to G, M1, M2 or R square. Now one of the masses is the whole earth, okay? And the other mass is the stone, which falls towards it. And so he used this, this law was used, but it took him 10 or 20 years to show that this acceleration due to gravity on the earth is 9.8 meters per second square. Okay? He took that law. Why? So this is how a science goes. Because he didn't have the mathematics ready. He had to develop calculus. Okay, because if you take a stone, say, falling from 10 meters or 30 meters, okay, from, from somewhere, from the top like this, then the stone is attracted, see the, this particular law is for point masses. So when you have this particular law here, this for point masses, M1, M2, okay. Nobody says about it, it is a big mass, whatever. Like the earth. The stone and the, this is just 30 meters, but the earth is much bigger. So the stone is not only attracted down here, it's attracted by everything. The Himalaya is attracting that on one side, not ocean is attracting it on the other side. All these elemental forces have to be added together. So you have to integrate. This is called integration in calculus. Just integration. So you have to take pieces of this thing and the calculus was not there okay, during Newton's time. So you have to develop calculus and people did not believe him that Calculus is the right thing because they are limiting procedures and so on. So the mathematics was not very much believed. So he had to give very geometrical proofs and all that. He was an excellent mathematician by the way. He was not only a physicist, he was, a, he was also a very skilled mathematician. And he gave geometrical proofs and all that to show that really the things are correct. The limiting limits and all that things came much later. Okay? That the limiting things, the sequence of limit, sequence of forward flow point and so on. All this thing came with Koshi and so on, much later in, it, in the 19th century or 18th, uh, 20th century. So, he had to deal with this. So, he had to develop calculus. Earth is not a point, so development of, it led to the development of calculus, by the way. So, it was not only Newton, it was also Leibniz who did that. And doing this thing, 
you get the acceleration due to uh, due to gravity is gm or r earth square r earth is the area for the earth which is about 6000 whatever 400 kilometers or something and mass of the earth has to be put in and you get the value 9.8 meters per second square so this is the density of gravitation so one law here is explaining everything it is like a unification of terrestrial gravity as well as the gravity in space uh, terrestrial things and all that and so so this was a resounding success it, because it did everything i mean it also explained motions of galaxies around the thing motions of macro molecules so from micro molecules to galaxies huge range of scale this uh, this law could explain so it was a big success resounding success so then why I have another theory of this? One, okay? See, inadequacy of Newton's theory. So, there was inadequacy here. The reason is, the force law is instantaneous. Okay? So, there is, it does not contain time. The theory of creativity, which says, signals can travel at most with the speed of light. Okay? So, that is, the, that is the one thing. And special relativity was there to stay. Okay? And so, what had to happen was that, Newton's theory had to be changed because of this. So this was in fact, there are two theories, Newton's gravity and there was special relativity. Both were contradicting each other. <coughs> so we cannot have such a thing in fact. In fact, in physics or science, you can't have two, it's simply unacceptable to have two theories which are inconsistent with each other. So something has to give. So as a special relativity had to go, but it had come because of electromagnetism, and so on, Maxwell's equation, all these things were there. So then, <laughs> special relativity was there. So this theory had to be changed and it was, it had to be changed. And the new theory of gravity was the general theory of relativity or Einstein's gravity. So this is Einstein's gravity, okay? So Einstein's gravity also does the same thing. I mean, here the thing is that there is no force, okay? So if you take this picture of the sun, and the planet, say, maybe the Earth, the planet is not attracted towards the Sun. Okay, so in this case, the paths which the planet follow are natural paths. They are like straight lines. They are called geodesic of the space time. Okay. So they follow, so the natural paths are actually geodesic. So this path which the Earth takes, it's a freely falling body in the, in the field of the Sun. Okay. So that's how, so, then, but then the problem is that if you have non-uniform gravity, the accelerations are different in different places. And here he was forced, I said he was forced to use curved space-time. That means the space-time, the earlier people were talking of Euclidean spaces, Euclidean space, which is, everybody knows, we learn Euclidean geometry in school and so on. You have to learn about complicated things, more complicated because it has curved objects, like sphere, for example. The sphere is a curved object. Okay, it has curvature. While a plane is flat, okay, three angles of a triangle and a triangle will add up to 180 degrees. But if you draw it on a sphere, it will not add up to 180 degrees. So yet, but this was first of Einstein, because of this I took him about 10 years to develop things there. Okay. So you can see the kind of things which are here, when there is real serious research, it's not a question of one month, two months, five months, ten months or one year or five years. It is sometimes 10 years, 20 years or a lifetime goes in actually getting something out. So gravitation is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. So what are gravitation waves? Gravitational waves are waves which are ripples in the curvature of space-time. They are just waves with curvature. So the, the curvature is what is changing. So to give an idea of curvature, I have the slide. So I have taken simple examples which are like uh, say detection on test particles, a free test particles. The sphere for example okay, is a curved object. So what I have taken is very simple examples. See the one thing, good thing in mathematics and so on is that if you go from, if you change the dimension, many things don't change. So your intuition which is true in say two dimensions which you can visualize also holds in higher dimensions. So, for general relativity, the dimension is 4, 3 space at one time. 
But if you draw these pictures in two dimensions of the sphere, you can see that this sphere is in fact a curved object. And one thing that happens in a sphere, for example, in a sphere, three angles or a triangle will not add up to one angle. You draw a triangle, and you can see that. In fact, Gauss tried to measure by three peaks. Uh, you know, he took three peaks in uh, Germany or Australia, Austria, and he tried to measure the angles there. And one thing this convention does is that the geodesics or the natural paths which are there, the distance between them changes. Okay. So if you take a plane and you draw two parallel lines, they never meet, they just go parallel. The distance between them remains the same everywhere. But if you take a sphere and start two geodesics, or which are straight lines here, parallel, they will meet at the pole. So the distance reduces. And this is a space of positive curvature. This is a hyperboloid. Here the lines, the geodesics, will go away from each other. And the reason for this is that the curvature is negative here. So you have negative curvature as well as positive curvature. But they, can, they are realized in two dimensions or three dimensions. Now if you take the gravitational waves, the curvature is changing in size. It's like an electromagnetic wave. For electromagnetic wave, you have got sine omega t, cos omega t. Okay, those are the sort of things which come here. Okay? So there, sine omega t and cos omega t oscillate. They have become positive, negative, positive, negative and so on. So that's what happens. Here also the same thing happens. The curvature oscillates. And what you see is that the particles, if they start out of here, in the beginning, the curvature is negative, so the curvature particles move away, then the particles move closer together as the things, the, the, the curvature becomes positive. So the length of the connecting vector, as it is called, keeps on changing. Okay? And this is how one, uh, in fact, detects this wave. So how do you detect the gravitational wave? You take a circle. The reason is the uh, the wave is a little bit more complicated, it's the tensor wave, okay. it's, a tensor, it's a metric tensor which is there. You take a circle, the circle becomes an ellipse, then back to a circle, and then that becomes an ellipse with the semi-major and semi-minor axis interchange. Now you put two particles there, okay, and monitor the distance between these particles, say with a laser or something, now we have laser. Then one can measure the path distance between this laser light, and so detect gravity. This is the principle of detection. So this was the thing there. And this is the kind of thing which goes on. Okay. So the circle becomes an ellipse and this is the kind of motion you get. If you have a gravitational wave going into the board or into the screen. But why did it take 100 years okay, to detect this wave? That is the question. Okay. And the reason is, gravity is a weak force. Gravity is a very weak force. There are four fundamental forces. Electromagnetic is one of them. There's a weak force, there's a strong force. The strong force keeps the nucleus together. Although the protons are charged, positively charged, they don't fly apart. The nucleus still keeps together. Why does it keep together? Because of the strong force. But gravity is the weakest force. Okay? An extremely weak force. And it, therefore, it is, the effect of the wave is very small on particles. So it, they are extremely hard to measure. And you can show this by this particular experiment, your know, demonstration. That's why I brought this glass of water. So this glass of water I am raising. Okay? Just this fact that I can raise this glass of water means that G is very small. Gravity of force is very weak. Why? The whole earth is pulling out on this glass. Okay? But with my arm, okay, which consists of one or two kilos, okay, I can raise this glass of water. And so many kilos are there in the earth. Okay? So, so why, how is my arm raising this? Finally, it is electromagnetic force. You go down to it, muscle, muscle contraction, then muscle contraction means uh, chemistry, and chemistry is in fact electrodynamic. Electrodynamic, electrons, and so on are there, shells and things. So, it's electromagnetic force versus gravitation. So, Earth is so big, and still I can easily raise it. A child walks, okay, on the gets up after one year and will start walking. Why? Because of the electromagnetic force is so much stronger than the gravitational force. So that is one of the... Since this glass of water is there, I can drink it. I can drink it. 
in the Ahmedabad with the lack of water. So that is uh, that is the reason. So gravity is a very weak force, and because of that, it is the uh, uh, long time to take. Okay. So how much have to how much do we have to measure the distance? Here? So here I have shown the number of particles. You have to measure distance. So I think it has uh, I think it has gone down. You have to measure distances to one part, uh, one thousand the size of the nucleus. The nucleus is ten to the minus fifteen meters. Okay, atom itself is small. Okay. And order of angstrom or something like that, 10 to the minus 10 meters. Five orders of magnitude down is the nucleus. That is 10 to the minus 15 meters. You have to go 1,000 the size of the size of the proton or nucleus to look at to actually detect this gravity phenomenon. That week, the G is that week. So, so there was a pioneer who was Joe Weber. That do this is a bar detector. So there's a bar here. And uh, there is a uh, there is a this thing here, the resonant bar detector. So he had aluminium rod and so on. But he started in the 60s and 70s, okay? and he he said he had detected something, but it was, it was probably not a detection. But because of his this thing, several groups started working on. Uh, but a better design, in fact, interferometer, laser interferometer. And it was actually put forward by this forward, Robert Forward, who was uh, actually an aeronautical engineer. Okay, I mean, he was engineer, but he got his PhD with Weber in Maryland. On gravity surveys, so he did a lot of work with this, in this thing. And uh, he uh, actually he wrote a letter to me. In uh, he is no more there, but he wrote a letter to me in '92. Saying, uh, I mean, I had written one of the papers. Uh, papers that got published in the Physical Review, and uh, he liked that paper very much. He said, I am telling my colleagues to do this exactly this kind of calculations, but they are not listening to me. I am very happy that you have done this calculation. So he sent, uh, you know, my my paper was there off. So there was no email, nothing was there. It came by post. You know, my paper was published in December. And uh, his letter came in February. Okay, so this thing uh, on forward enterprises because he had a company and he built an interferometer in his backyard. Okay. And uh, he, he was actually the first of the first to build go into this kind of design. But he died uh, about by cancer I think around 2001 or so. So anyway, so that's the one story there. So these are not bad. Detectors. There's a beam splitter. There is a this thing mirrors here. These are two masses. There's a beam splitter here. And this is a scalable design. You can make this interferometer very <coughs> as big as you like. So that is the basic idea of this laser interferometer. And because if this thing moves, you will see the path differences there between the masses. What you will see is some light will leak out onto the detector, photo detector, and you will be able to. So this is a movie which shows how the things are detected. So here's a laser, and this is a sort of a what do you call it, schematic kind of a movie. So this is the laser interferometer. <laughs> These are the two mirrors, which are the masses. So now nothing leaks out to the photo detector because there's no wave, there's no gravitational wave. Now if there's a gravitational wave, you will see what happens. So now you see this. One arm like this, the other arm shorter. Okay. So it is going like this, and light leaks out onto the photo detector. This thing, and this is how you detect gravity. Okay. So this is what is happening. If there is a wave going into the ball, these are the fringes. You think of this as fringes which are going. When the fringes match, then uh, nothing. There is no light. But if the fringes don't match back, then the light which uh, pull, hits on to the photodiode. Okay? So this is how the the waves are detected. But remember that you have to go down to 10 to the minus 18 meters. Uh, how are you going to do that? That's a uh, that's the feat. That's the technological feat. Because you have this ground. This is vibrating. 
is vibrating at the level of 1 micron into the minus 6 meter. You know, that's the sort of level. You have to go 12 orders for magnitude <coughs> below this, take to the minus 6 meter. And so what you need is isolation, seismic isolation, all sorts of things. These things took time actually to come up. The technology had to be developed. This is the interferometer, this is the real detector, which is in Louisiana, this is the one in the US, uh, 4 kilometers in length. So you bend your arm very long, so you start a tabletop interferometer, so one 4 kilometer arm detector. So one mass is there, okay. the problem is this Okay, I think I'll leave it here because <laughs> that confuses me. Anyway, so those are or but I have to show that this is one mark, this is one mark, the uh, all the lasers and everything are in the central building. So this is the kind of interferometer is there. And one more interferometer in Hatford, three thousand kilometers to the north west, okay? North west, yeah, of US. And one more now. This is the US, India is coming with the other detector. Here, Nandes, okay. just uh, what, 60 kilometers from Nandes, Aounda Nandar is the place. And about 10 kilometers from that village, this state of detector is being built. Right now, I think it is just starting, so I think the civil wars are going on. Because we need to make the tubes, make the laser light goes through the So the laser light is of the order of a megawatt. The whole uh, cavity has to be very powerfully, uh, uh, very powerful laser in order to do this because you have to cut down the photon. So one noise is the seismic noise. If I told you, it is cut down because of the springs and so on. The springs and isolation. So every stage, there are six stages of the spring. So one every stage cuts down by one over x square factor. You write down Newton's law, x double dot equal to the whole sector, okay? Plus it's a harmonic oscillator. It's a simple harmonic oscillator. Because the oceans are extremely small, you can linearize all your equations. So what you have is just a restoring force in linear. So x double dot plus omega naught square x equal to y. Okay? Now you Fourier transform this. And what you get is basically 1 over x square is the kind of thing. So uh, springs are at about a fraction of a hertz. That's the resonant frequency. And you are observing around 10 hertz or 20 hertz or something. So each stage gives a factor of like 100 or 1000 or something like 400, 500. And you use 5 6 stages to get down to 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that's the thing that you have to make your lasers very powerful and so on. So this is all the experimental part of the thing, which is, uh, which is a feat. Now I come to the sources. I have cut down the water sources, but what has been detected so far? What has been detected so far are binaries. Okay. Either black holes or neutron stars. So basically these are the kind of things which are there. You have got two stars which go together and they produce a waveform which looks like this. Oh, what is this? Okay, that's the So that is the waveform, which is there. This is called a churn. Okay. Because it sounds like a bird sound if you make this is all in audio frequencies. 20, 30 hertz to 1 kilohertz, you get uh, noise, I mean you get a sound. And if you may uh, convert this into sound waves, it will sound like a bird. Okay. So that's why it's called a churn. So the, this is the this is the kind of waveform. But even doing the data analysis is a very problematic problematic thing. Because the coalescing binary waveform, because the reason is that general relativity is a non-linear theory and it's very hard to calculate. It's not so easy as Newton's theory. Okay? In Newton's theory, you have two body problems solved very easily. I mean, there are textbooks. Like Goldstein will give you that solution, okay? Reduce mass and so on. That. But in Einstein general relativity, it's a non-linear theory. 
And what happens is that they have to, you need to do approximation. And you can't solve them. So far, even after 100 years, nobody has been able to solve the two body problem exactly. And so one has to do this numerically, numerical relativity or approximation. And that is what has been done for this particular waveform which has been obtained. But you need a lot of templates and all that to search with each waveform, even with supercomputers, just to calculate any cycle takes three weeks to hold it. And so far only a few thousand such waveforms are calculated. But we need a million. So we have to do interpolation and so on to actually calculate what is the really the template of this waveform. So this was all that was done. So there is a match filter, so this was our contribution in this thing. Uh, Rundar and Satya Prakash, in 91 and 94, they wrote this paper. Uh, I mean at that time there was nothing, but we were still uh, working on this kind of problem. And we gave a procedure as to how this could be done. How to place template and so on. And one had to use metric, uh, I mean you put a metric on the parameter space and so on. And there's a metric and so on, right? which actually I I was able to give that metric. But finally I found that metric was already given by CRO in 1945, okay, in some statistics problem. Okay. So uh, anyway, the point is that metric is there and I use the metric to put what are called templates. Okay. So there are these waveforms here, but the point is that if you take many uh, different masses, every waveform is different. So if you take a mass, solar mass, one mass to be equal to say the mass of the sun, another mass like two mass, two solar masses, it will be different from one which is one solar mass and one which is three solar masses. So you have to densely sample the space with this template. Okay? And that's the procedure we gave, how far should you keep the template and so on in order to pull out, extract the signal from the mass. So even though you are going to take to the minus 18 meters, this waveform produces things like at, at the level of 10 to the minus 22 or 10 to the minus 23. Okay. So the metric strain which is there is at the level of orders of magnitude, two orders of magnitude below this. So that's what it shows. This is a waveform. If you scale it down, you can't see anything in the noise. This is how the noise looks. This is the data for the detector. You can't see anything. But now if you run this filter okay, on this thing with the correct template, then the peak, it can't be seen there, but uh, you can see a peak at least in this thing. The peak shows up and it gives you the parameter of the waveform and also shows the detection. You put a threshold across it and which gives you the probability with which confidence with which you can say that you have detected a gravitational wave. So every detection is in fact a statistical, but that is always true. Okay, I mean any detection you make, even I don't know, I mean like I can see somebody sitting there I don't know the, the the person is already there. Unless I go and touch, then I get some more confidence. It could be a hologram. How do I know that that's really a person there? Okay. So, uh, so any detection which you have is in fact a statistical statement. And here also, this is not a, this is also not uh, any different. So these are the things. So this is what was done. So how how far can the detector see? So the detectors, so there is a standard siren as it's called because of the chirp of this thing. You take a 1.4, 1.4 solar mass uh, binary, the neutron stars are supposed to have this 1.4 solar mass, and that's been found. This mass was given by Chandrasekhar. This is called the Chandrasekhar mass. That a neutron star has 1.4 solar mass. Uh, that's the sort of mass you have. All this uh, the neutron degeneracy pressure keeps the neutron star, the star. Up. So this star, which is this kind of thing, which is there, the current detectors can see up to 150 mega parsecs. Okay, in the last part, O3. Now what's the parsec? Parsec is three, three and quarter light years. Okay, so one light year is the distance which is from light travels in one year, so which is roughly. 10 to the 13 kilometers, 3 into 10 to the 7 seconds into 3 into 10 to the 5 kilometers per second. So you get 9 into 10 to the 12, so roughly 10 to the 13 kilometers. Mega, so at a parsec is 3.25, 3 so you multiply it by 3 or something. 
and then mega parsec is uh, million times that, and this is 150 mega parsec. So this is like something like 500 million or 450 million right here. You can see with the current detector lying over in the world of detectors. And now the Japanese detector also I joined in, which is the uh, uh, just coming in, but it is not this thing. So two early black holes were merged with this, which I showed you in the first slide. And you can see that there were like seven, I already talked about them. There were 36 solar masses, 29 solar masses. Those were the masses of the group. Our template, that our procedure was there. It also tells you what are the parameters of the signal. So the parameters of signals are masses, the insulation of the orbit and so on. So it gives you 36 and 29 solar masses. It, it coalesces into a black hole of mass 62. But if you add 36 and 29, you get 65. So what has happened to three solar masses? All those three solar masses have gone in gravity. So three masses, solar masses have been converted into gravity. So the huge amount of energy. But although the energy is huge, the effect on the detector is extremely small. That is the point of it. There was with this thing something like few hours per second. The flux was like few hours per centimeter square per second. But still, uh, the amount, the ridiculous move is like one part it takes to the 21. Okay? So, four kilometers to multiply and do that thing, it turns out to be something like 10 to the minus 18 or se minus 17 meters. Okay? So, that was the sort of distance they moved and you could detect that. There was a second event also, I am not going to do this because I think I am running out of time. But I want to show, so I think it helps me because then. I don't believe. <laughs> so this is the other event which was a neutron star violin. We'll see. This is a computer simulation, it's not this actual event. And it heralded the stage of the age of multi-messenger astronomy because immediately after the event, gamma rays were observed. One one second later, one two one point seven seconds. So it's like two seconds. And uh, <coughs> The star is something like this binary star was measured to be about 130 million light years. So 130 million years versus 2 seconds. The factor is 10 to the 50. So immediately one could conclude from this that gravitational wave, the speed of gravitational wave and the speed of electromagnetic wave is, is within one part in 10 to the 50. Experimentally say that. So generally I don't even predict the same speed. That Gravitational waves travel the speed of light, same thing. But here was a, in fact, a, a, what, real measurement, okay? And there were so many things which came out of this thing. One is that uh, the earlier electromagnetism and so on, uh, from that one could say that that knowledge told us that that should be around 10 solar masses and so on. But what we found, the, uh, the black holes were really much bigger. 30 solar masses, 35 solar masses and some of the, the biggest black hole which we have seen is 150 solar masses up to now with the detector. So that's huge system. So uh, we had to revise all our astrophysical theories. Okay? So the earlier theories were not very correct okay? of saying that uh, so we learnt a lot of things because of this thing here. Also it showed how how the large, okay, anything about uh, iron Iron has the lowest uh, what that, binding energy in the thing. thing there. Anything about iron, gold and so on. Okay? All that comes because of neutron stars. That's also what it showed. The neutron star collision produces so much of force and so on that the higher lanthanium and so on sort of things, what is called the R process. It produces gold, lead, uranium, things like that. So these things are produced in this uh, kind of a uh, so that's what it showed. Then cosmology, Hubble constant, how fast is the universe expanding? So that also it gives a, uh, gives some uh, things on. Then equation of state, how uh, how soft or how hard state is the equation of state of the neutron star. So now LIGO India, which I want to talk about, is India is also building a detector, which is called LIGO India, because it is in 
collaboration with the U.S. and it is coming up in Maharashtra, Amir, just uh, about uh, 56 kilometers uh, from Amir, Bounda Nagra. From that village, it is something like 10 kilometers or something. And uh, actually, I had gone to the site. I mean, did a site survey. Five days they were doing site survey. Goda, crater, and so on, and things like that. And uh, we saw that, and I, actually, I thought that this was a good site. Maybe, where we can do your nothing. No villages, nothing. And so there could be, there would be no disturbance. The whole thing is that you are observing such minute distances that you have to measure. Any disturbance will be a problem. So you should be away from all human civilization and things like that, or water bodies and so on. So still there is a signature dam and it is across the mountain. But still it's okay. But the main thing with this detector is that we are far away from all detectors. Okay. You are on the diametrically opposite side. So we can triangulate the source. So these detectors which are there, they are object detectors. They are like a radio antenna. Okay. Not a dish, but a dipole. Like a dipole. So if you have radio dipole and you have only one dipole, you can't say where your electromagnetic wave is coming. That's the problem with this also. This gravitational wave detectors are also like that. Okay. So you need several detectors when, uh, which are far away, so it's far away, which will actually triangulate you. So this is what happens here. So if we are so far away, we can actually pinpoint where the source is. And this is the pictures of the detectors where they are around the earth. Two in the US, then one of them actually is the Virgo detector, the other is too small, the one in Japan. And India is there, but I, the LIGO India. Yeah, LIGO India has gone down below the thing, that thing. Where there is an arrow you can see, which is pointing to India. So, so I come to the end of my talk basically. This is the birth of a new astronomy. So it is in fact, uh, why are we detecting gravitational waves? The first thing is that it's an astronomical tool. Just like we had optical astronomy which was opened by Galileo 400 years back. Radio astronomy which opened in 1930, about 1930-1940. The others are infrared which brought in, you know, each astronomy brings in something. So radio astronomy brought in all sorts of quasars, radio pulsars, so many things. Cosmic microwave background, that was one of the things of radio astronomy which could have been discovered in optically. Then exoplanets, planets and other solar systems. That was done because of the infrared astronomy. So these are all probes of the universe. Okay? So we have a new window, uh, which is the gravitational wave astronomy. So my punchline is one below the, below the screen. <laughs> and this is the future road map. So we are, the current discoveries are just tip of the iceberg. The OFO run is going to start in 223 of LIGO, Virgo and now the Japanese detector and we are going to get to something like 160 to 190 megaparsecs. It was 150 megaparsecs or 160 there and LIGO India should join the network in a decade. There are also pulsar timing arrays for millisecond pulsars which are very accurate clocks, much better than uh, many of the clocks which are made on Earth. So these also can be used as uh, to detect gravitational waves. But they are in a different frequency band, the nanohertz. Okay. And there also it is possible that soon they might make an alarm. And today I have a meeting actually at four o'clock of this uh, thing uh, where we have to decide when the group can say that they have made a detection. So there is a committee, international committee which has been established of eight people, two from India, two from US, two from Europe, two from Australia. And I am one of the committee members. And today, every week we have a meeting to discuss what exactly should be the criteria that these people can say, the international groups can say that they have detected gravitational waves. This will be in a different bag. And we will get different, different uh, information of supermassive black holes, like the one at the center of Australia. There are plans for 2.30 with the LISA, Einstein telescope and so on. And there is uh, a plan to put detectors in space 
FIFA, like for such a reason, it is not a very So that will see uh, it will range from 10 to the minus 4 hertz to the of 1 hertz. So that is the sort of thing. So this is, uh, this is in fact, what I would like to say is, uh, Just the beginning. We are just starting the program. So we are still up. Thank you very much, Professor, for your wonderful lecture. We have collected some questions from the audience. Right. So the first question is, many students over here are interested in pursuing a career in astronomy and astrophysics. Right. So uh, they were asking if you could share a few words of guidance. Oh, that's, uh, yeah, And uh, the second question that we received today was How do you foresee the application of gravitational waves yeah. in the near future? So, the application in what sense? The one thing is that if you think of usefulness, it's the technology. Because even to make a detector like this, it needs an uh, enormous amount of technology. Okay, so we have to bring in a whole lot of technology to India to make a detector like this. Okay, so like lasers have to be absolutely stable, okay? They're mostly monochromatic, okay? Then uh, vacuum systems, laser systems, control systems, computing. You need advanced computing, okay? Uh, supercomputers and so on, which are required in order to run this experiment completely. So those but those are sort of spin-offs. Directly of gravitational waves, the one thing is astronomy. Okay. You, so LIGO India adds to the astronomy. So that we can actually pinpoint the source on the right now with two detectors, you only get a circle in the sky. Okay. So you can say that the source lies on a circle. Now the Japanese detector is slowly coming on. So it might give you some more information. But LIGO India will be the best. Okay. Because we are so far away from all detectors that uh, the triangulation will be much better. And uh, we may be, see the first force which was shown, it was localized with, within some 100 square degrees, 100 or 200. If LIGO India was working at that time, we would have got it in 2 degrees. Within 2 square degrees, we would have located the force. A uh, factor of 100. Okay, so it brings down uh, the area, the location. To, uh, to factor of that then. So astronomers, other astronomers go and see there. They can actually search over that area to see if there are other sources and other things which are also uh, with that particular source. I mean, not only black holes are uh, coalesced, it may be that it, it, something else is there and they may be able to see that and look for sources there. Like for the neutron star, they did that. But that was 30 square degrees because of one Yeah. So the last question that we will be taking today is, uh, you have a background in mathematics and your major was there. Yeah. So what is your experience of being an astrophysicist with a major in mathematics, switching to this field? Yeah, yeah. So I think it helps. It absolutely helps. Because uh, many things, I think, uh, uh, the attitude of physicists normally towards mathematics is sort of, I don't know, how to call it. We should call it sporting attitude, okay? So, <laughs> so kind of a sporting attitude is there. And uh, so, they don't take it that 
uh, officers told so much, take it seriously. I mean, uh, many things. And uh, and many things, uh, they, they probably don't use it, because they don't, uh, unless they require it actually. And only then they get into it. And one of the things which I can, can say in my own way, my own thing, is about LISA, the laser interferometric space antenna. There you can't cancel the noise very easily of the lasers, okay, because it's an unequal arm interferometer. You can't keep the spacecrafts in one place. They are always orbiting. The distances are changing all the time. So you have to cancel it in a in software in a way. So what you have to do is you have to combine the beams with certain time delays. Okay. And that particular problem, combining the beam with delays, the delays can be converted into operators. That's what I did actually. And one can see that this is a problem in algebraic geometry. And which has already been solved. I mean, it was posed by Hilbert in 1890, but it was solved by Grobner and his students in 1970. Okay, or what is called the module of CCGs. So you have to go to rings and modules and so on in this kind of things, which physicists normally would not know. Okay, I mean, <laughs> over rings and modules. They know up to vector spaces, Hilbert spaces, maybe up to there because of Fourier transforms. <laughs> but I think. Uh, since I went through the reverse of mathematics for three years, so because I missed out on the physics, but I think I made, made that up during my PhD and later when I joined the physics department, I had to teach physics. So I better know what I was teaching. So <laughs> I learned a lot of physics that way also. <laughs> so it's, uh, I mean, Physicists actually, at least theoretical physicists, need to know a lot of mathematics. In fact, I am writing, in fact, a book on the mathematics for physicists, which has uh, many of the. I mean, it starts with topology, okay, I mean, which uh, points at topology and so on, and like that, and Hilbert spaces and so on. Groups and group representations, things like that. <laughs> now I have not put rings and modules, but at least this I have put. <laughs>